Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights and expression. Okay, welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am, as always, your host, Nico Perino. And on today's show, we're talking about the seminal 1964 Supreme Court case, New York Times versus Sullivan. This was an important First Amendment case that limited the ability of public officials to successfully sue their critics for defamation. And as the court ruled in that case, America has a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that in some cases, defamation law has been used to limit that debate. It's important to note at the outset here that subsequent follow-on cases to Sullivan applied the same limits to public figures like celebrities and not just public officials such as politicians. Over the years, Sullivan has received plaudits as one of the greatest decisions ever issued by the Supreme Court. Yale Law professor Owen Fiss wrote that the decision solidified the free speech traditions that have ensured the vibrancy of American democracy. And the late Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, William Rehnquist, said Sullivan made American public officials more accountable, the American media more watchful, and the American people better informed. But, but, Sullivan is increasingly under attack from politicians, activists, and even sitting justices of the Supreme Court. They believe the decision went too far, enabling the news media and others to defame fellow citizens with little to no consequence. A bill introduced in Florida this week seeks to limit Sullivan's protection for speech. And joining us today to discuss New York Times v. Sullivan and its future is a distinguished panel of experts, including Floyd Abrams, who is senior counsel at Cahill, Gordon, and Rendell. And he is tr- described by some as America's greatest First Amendment lawyer. Floyd, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. It's good to be here. We also have my colleague at FIRE, J.T. Morris. He's a senior attorney. J.T., good to see you. Thanks, Nico. Excited to be here this morning. And we have Matthew Schaefer, who is an adjunct law professor at Fordham University School of Law. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So let's start at the beginning here, get a little bit of background on New York Times v. Sullivan. JT, I want to start with you. What are the historical facts that led to the New York Times v. Sullivan case? Sure. So the story of Sullivan starts in the midst of the civil rights movement in Alabama uh, during the early 1960s. A group of Martin Luther King supporters wanted to raise more national awareness and support for what was happening in the segregation of South. So they place an editorial slash advertisement in the New York Times uh, called Heed Their Rising Voices. The advertisement praised Dr. King's efforts as well as the efforts of student protesters at Alabama State College. Uh, The advertisement also criticized the Montgomery, Alabama police for harassing Dr. King and repressing the student protesters. Uh, And while the, the advertisement criticized the powers that be generally, it didn't name any police officer or public official specifically. Who it did name were many supporters of Dr. King and the civil rights movement, including famous figures like Jackie Robinson and Eleanor Roosevelt, and a group of influential black preachers, including Ralph Abernathy. Uh, Now the piece included a, a few inaccuracies. For example, it said that the local police had arrested Dr. King seven times when it was actually four. Uh, The piece also claimed that the police had ringed the campus where the students were protesting when the police actually never encircled the campus, uh, although they did show up with some machine guns and tear gas canisters to take 30 student protesters into custody. Uh, The point is, the essence of the article was true. Police were using harassment, violence, and intimidation to squash protests. So stepping back, you had a piece in a preeminent national publication, the New York Times, uh, revealing the struggle of the civil rights movement against violence and intimidation uh, in the segregation of South and naming some pretty famous figures who were supporting the civil rights movement. So you might imagine that the advertisement upset the power structure in Alabama. It did. Uh, somewhat ironically, it was actually the local media in Montgomery that started the attack on the ad in the New York Times. A local editor in chief wrote a piece accusing the Times and the supporters of the civil rights movement of lying. Uh, And soon the public safety commissioner in charge of the Montgomery police, a man named L.B. Sullivan, learned of the ad. Uh, And even though the ad did not mention him, he sent a retraction demand to the New York Times and four of the preachers named on the ad. Uh, The Times, understandably so, was puzzled uh, as to how Sullivan could believe anything in the advertisement was about him because it didn't name him. Uh, So it asked Sullivan to clarify. Sullivan didn't clarify, and instead, he went to an Alabama state court uh, 
and sued the time and four of the pre- the four preachers for libel, uh, based lar- largely on those inaccuracies I talked about earlier. Uh, he actually claimed no harm from the ad. He asked only for presumed damages based on the ad, his theory that the ad implicated him because he was the public safety commissioner. A jury of 12 white men agreed with Sullivan, awarded him a $500,000 judgment against the Times and the four preachers. That, in today's figures, is over $5 million. And the Alabama Supreme Court affirmed that amount would have ruined the preachers. Uh, it certainly would have put a huge dent in the Times finances. And not only that, you know, Sullivan's case wasn't the only libel suit brought against the Times and other uh, press entities at the time. Southern officials had a strategy of trying to use uh, very plaintiff-friendly libel laws, which at the time lacked any constitutional limits, to stifle the press and punish speech about the civil rights movement. So by the time 1964 came around, the Times was facing almost $300 million in potential libel damages in Southern courts. Uh, So the Times, along with the preachers, had one choice, uh, ask the Supreme Court to hear their case. Uh, The Supreme Court did. What resulted was a unanimous decision, not only tossing out the Alabama jury's verdict, but rendering, as you pointed out, Nico, one of the most important Supreme Court opinions on the First Amendment. And I'm going to stop there because I would love to hear Floyd and Matt talk about the details of the court's decision. Yeah, I I want to ask before we get to the details of the decision, more about kind of the context surrounding uh, the case. I, I had read somewhere, for example, that Times reporters were even discouraged from visiting Alabama for fear that they might be spurred with one of these defamation lawsuits. This was very much kind of an asymmetric warfare tactic that was used at the time in the South, where you had juries, for example, that were very sympathetic to segregation, uh, that were hearing these cases that were brought against news organ, these defamation cases that were brought against news organizations. So, you know, people were trying to speak out on the civil rights causes of the day, right, Floyd? And news organizations were very wary of doing it. Yeah, you make a very a very good point. Uh, this was a, almost a systemic uh, attack on the ability of the national press to write about what was going on in the South uh, and what was going on, in, especially uh, with respect to racial issues, segregation, uh, and the like. Uh, and so there had been massive judgments Uh, at the time, against Time Magazine, uh, against CBS, uh, you know, the national entities of uh, great power uh, and significance, uh, and who, when they spoke out, uh, really made a difference in terms of national public opinion. So from the point of view of the press, or the national press, I'd call it, they were at risk of not being able to cover the most important political social event going on in the nation, which was the effort to transform the white South uh, into one in which uh, black people had at least the beginning of some semblance uh, of uh, civil rights. So this case you know, arose then in a context in which it was not just an issue, uh, as it was certainly viewed then, not just an issue of whether the New York Times could say this or Time Magazine could say that, but whether the American people would be receiving uh, candid information of a sort which would frequently be critical of what was going on uh, in the White South And then they were hauled in in front of all white Southern juries and an increasing amount of libel judgments were entered against them. So that was the context, uh, the legal context, uh, legal, political, social context uh, in which the case arose. So Matthew, I want to ask a little bit about what defamation law looked like prior to 1964, right? So you would file one of these defamation claims or claim defamation. And what did the First Amendment say about defamation? Like what sort of protections did the news media have at the time against frivolous claims that were used to more or less just silence critical coverage? Sure. So one of the great aspects uh, or a central aspect of Sullivan is that it federalized uh, or it began the federalization of much of the common law of libel. Um, Before Sullivan, before 1964, 
the common law of libel was largely up to state legislatures, state judges. Uh, we had no, uh, essentially no uh, First Amendment protections uh, that defendants could raise uh, when they were targeted for uh, saying, you know, at its most basic bad things about people, right? Uh, so it was essentially a constitutional free zone. Uh, there's a uh, early case in 1930s, 1940s, uh, Chaplinsky, that uh, includes a, a often repeated uh, quote that defamation is one of those uh, areas of uh, speech that has never been thought to be protected by the First Amendment. I would um, put one caveat on that. Uh, in the 1940s, the Supreme Court did consider uh, a defamation judgment. This one, I believe it was out of New York, but maybe Floyd can correct me if I'm wrong. It was called Sweeney versus Schenectady Publishing. Uh, that case, the court heard, unfortunately, oral arguments weren't transcribed at the time. Uh, but that case, the court heard, and we have newspaper accounts of what was argued. And uh, there, 25 years before Sullivan, or about 25 years before Sullivan, you have, for the first time uh, in the 20th century anyway, you have this issue brought to the Supreme Court about maybe the First Amendment does have something to say about libel judgments. Unfortunately, um, one uh, justice did not hear that case, so it was an eight justice court. It split four to four. So there was no opinion that, that came out of that argument. But one of the critiques of Sullivan is, well, this was essentially an outgrowth of the Warren Court, and this was a product of the 1960s and the civil rights era. But I, I always like to mention Sweeney because I think it, it, it makes clear that, you know, this was not just some sort of, um, uh, something that came out of the imagination of the Warren court. This was an idea that both in the 1940s in front of the Supreme Court and as I've argued before, long before that, um, there were arguments that indeed the common law of libel should be limited by the First Amendment or the counterparts in the state constitution. I, I, I would like to add to that, though, that <clears throat> say on a personal level, I graduated from law school in 1959. There was a libel course that was taught at Yale Law School when I was there, but it was taught the way admiralty, a court about a case about ships at sea, was taught as a you know a separate body of law, a unique body of law, uh, and anyone that was interested in libel law, it'd be fun to take the course, but it was not to any real degree, integrated uh, into the constitutional law courses because, uh, as, as Matthew points out, I mean, there, there was no case decided by the Supreme Court about libel, which talked about the First Amendment at all. And so it, it took a, a new look. I mean, I agree with what, what was just said, I mean, but it took a new look in terms of a decided ruling, not four to four, but nine to nothing uh, for, for the Supreme Court to say, look, this is speech. We're talking about speech here, speech about public matters, uh, and it is necessary to integrate First Amendment law and libel law in some way together. So I want to get into the the meat of the ruling. But first, for our, we, we have listeners who come from all different backgrounds. Some are lawyers, some are just interested in cultural free speech issues. JT, can you describe what defamation, libel, slander are just for a lay audience before we dive yeah, into Yeah. So, world? you know, the American tradition, right, defamation law is meant to remedy harms to your reputation. So if, if somebody says a defamatory falsehood that uh, you know, harms your reputation, you have a remedy for it. That's about as simple as, as I can get. Um, it doesn't cover opinions. It doesn't cover hyperbole. It doesn't cover um, things that aren't false statements of fact. So it's a so this sort of kind of cliche example of someone publishing or you know telling a group of people that you're a sex offender when you're demonstrably not, right? In, in certain contexts, you know, the important thing about defamation law is context. Con context is really important. Right. And that, that's even more important in today's digital age when we have Twitter and Facebook and, and people posting stuff all the time. So um, 
you know, there might be, and I think Elon Musk, uh, I believe, you know, he called somebody a pedophile. He was sued for defamation and uh, he escaped without liability because the context of, of him saying that uh, was it was not a statement of fact. It was sort of rhetoric and hyperbole. Uh, and so it wasn't it couldn't it couldn't hold a defamation lawsuit. Um, so context is really important. Um, there's there, there are some categories that most states have called defamation per se. Uh, you accuse somebody falsely of a crime or something that uh, impacts their standing in the business community. Um, for some of the older categories, I think you if you accuse somebody of having a loathsome disease, which was essentially a, a sexually transmitted disease, um, those those are are deemed defamatory. You know, sort of as a matter of law, you don't have to prove they harmed you. Um, but even those categories today are, are a lot more malleable than they used to be. Uh, but essentially, defamation is is intended to, in the American tradition, is intended to remedy harms to your reputation. And, and defamation is kind of an umbrella term for for libel and slander. Libel being written, defamation, and slander being being spoken. And Matthew, you're in. Yeah, to- just to piggyback on what JT was saying, um, I think that one of the ways to think about libel before Sullivan and after Sullivan is to draw an analogy to, uh, you know, the oft repeated phrase in criminal law, presumed uh, innocent until proven guilty, right? Um, Defamation is a very strange tort historically. Uh, It essentially in the civil context presumed that the defendant was guilty of defaming the plaintiff. After Sullivan, that all changed and I think you could argue that Sullivan restored a presumption of innocence in the context of defamation. So it really flipped the script. Um, to, to, to just to add to that, our law came from England where they continue to have just that same presumption that speech, which is harsh or defamatory, says bad things about people, is false. Uh, that's the starting point. And then from them, from there, the newspaper, if it's a newspaper, has to prove that it was true. I uh, Actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Floyd, because one of the first podcasts I did some, something like six years ago was with this woman, Deborah Lipstadt, who I believe is a professor at Emory, uh, a historian of the Holocaust. And she accused David Irving of being a Holocaust denier. David Irving, I believe, is a British um, historian yeah. um, who published and translated Goebbels' diaries, for example, and has... Uh, become sort of a conspiracy theorist, Holocaust denial, and she called him out for that. Uh, and David Irving sued, sued her uh, in, in England uh, for defamation. And because the presumption is that the statement is untrue and defamatory, Deborah Lipstadt, in order to win the case, essentially had to prove that the Holocaust was happening, like had to make a historical argument that the Holocaust happened in order to win, win the case against David Irving. So it's in the United States, we're a bit unique in that the the presumption is that the statement is not defamatory until it's proven. But let's get into uh, New York Times v. Sullivan now um, and what that case did and what the new standard was for defamation that it laid out. Matthew, do you want to take the first crack at this? Sure. Um, I think it's presumptuous with Floyd on the call, but uh, I'll, I'll do it anyway. Um, well, I'll pitch it to Floyd after <laughs> and, and ask about the impact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have it all wrong, Matthew, everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an arcane rule to Sullivan, and then there's a central lesson. Uh, both are important for different reasons. So the arcane rule is what we call the actual malice rule, that uh, if, a, if a public official that is someone you know, who works for the government, uh, usually higher, higher ranking officials, although those lines, you know, move depending on what jurisdiction you find yourself in. But when a public official brings a defamation claim, the rule that uh, Justice Brennan writing for the court adopted in Sullivan was that that public official must plead and ultimately prove that the defendant acted with actual malice. That is a knowledge of falsity, or a high degree of awareness of probable falsity. Essentially, the plaintiff has to prove that the defendant knowingly lied uh, in making the defamatory statement. So that's the arcane rule. Floyd can speak to why that's so important. Um, The second rule, the, the central tenet, the central lesson that we get from Sullivan is that in the United States, we have a Republican form of government, 
And the people, the power that lies first with the people and those in government are the agents of the people who are the principles. And under Sullivan, Justice Brennan, he, he goes through the history of the Sedition Act in the late 1790s and the run up to the election of 1800. And from that sordid history where the uh, supporters of the Adams administration were tossing uh, the Jeffersonians into jail, he came up with this idea that, um, that it, if freedom of speech means anything in the United States, it means that individuals ought to be able to criticize the government and the governors without fear of liability. The risk, if we did not adopt the arcane rule like actual malice, is that there would be a chilling effect and that people who, again, in whom power resides would be unable to uh, you know, shame officials out of office or to shame them into better behavior, right? So in the late 1790s, in the early 18, 1800s, you actually see commentators and, and some courts, at least, talking about a duty to defame uh, because um, through criticism of public officials, that is how self-government works. And there's even some correspondence exchanged earlier in the 1780s, 1790s, essentially positing the question, if we, did, if we had not been able to defame the British, would there have been a revolution, right? So you have that idea kind of drawn through the centuries, and that is what uh, Justice Brennan ensconced in New York Times versus Sullivan. So, so you need to have a really high standard to sort of discourage the defamation claims that were happening in, in the South. Like it's very likely that they're going to lose and because you could file diff, frivolous um, defamation suits, right? Um, that you have no chance of winning, but that would have the net effect because litigation is costly and time consuming of just shutting people up, right? Shutting up coverage. Floyd, did he get it right? Uh, uh, you got an A. Uh, <laughs> no, no, completely right. But remember, too, I mean, when we talk about New York Times versus Sullivan, that, that those statements perfectly summarized uh, arose in the context of the uh, racial, uh, what, development, uh, oppression uh, to some extent, and in certain obvious ways in the South. Uh, and <clears throat> so on that issue, an opposing voice could not be heard without being put at risk of being put before uh, an all-white uh, Southern jury. I mean, in picking the jury, uh, they called black people by their first name uh, in New York Times versus Sullivan. I mean, the, it, it's just important... Uh, we it, it's developed a lot, and that's what we're here to talk about. But to understand the degree to which what was needed was was some sort of juridical uh, uh, statement uh, as a matter of First Amendment law, which would protect the right to speak out <clears throat> on important issues and criticize the power structure. So, so it's been 60 years since the Sullivan decision. And JT, what do you kind of feel is its most important impact? Was this a sea change in the world of First Amendment law? I mean, did news organizations immediately after the ruling come down to breathe a sigh of, of relief, weight lifted off their shoulders, and now we are all free to uh, do critical reporting? on public officials? Yeah, I, th I think that's part of it. And, and I'll let Matthew and, and, and Floyd address that. They have a lot more experience in, in the media uh, side of things than I do. But I'll give you two answers. I think one, um, you know, the, the central concept Matthew talked about, right, this profound commitment to a, a uninhibited, robust, and, and wide open national debate, um, that has permeated so much of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in other areas, right? Snyder v. Phelps, Hustler v. Falwell, uh, right, giving breathing space for things that people might consider hate speech or, or offensive speech, that's protected. McIntyre v. Ohio, one of the most important decisions protecting anonymous speech, pulled a lot of principles from New York Times v. Sullivan. Um, you know, Miami Herald v. Tornillo, right, one of the most the, the important case protecting the editorial discretion of newspapers, and, and that's now at issue in, in these social media moderation cases. 
pull a lot of principles from Sullivan and all from that central concept of, of that robust commitment to a public debate. Um, so I think that's, you know, one really important legacy of, of Sullivan is it really allowed the Supreme Court to expand important First Amendment protections. From my own experience, you know, I, I've never represented a lot of media uh, companies, but I have represented a lot of individuals uh, sued by mayors and, and school board officials and city councilmen. Sullivan has been a godsend for them because we can look at a complaint, we can look at a demand letter, and I can pick up the phone and say, where's your, you know, what do you have to show that my client lied knowingly, right? What do you have to show that my client didn't do their homework? What do you have to show for actual malice? And, and a lot of the times they go away. And if they don't, it still gives us a chance to weed out those claims that are so obviously designed not to remedy a, a reputational harm, but to silence others, uh, to shame others into self-censorship and to scare others into self-censorship under you know, finding the, the threat of financial ruin. So I think for, for the every man, Sullivan has been vastly important, especially in the digital age today. I think Sullivan's even more relevant because social media has given people, so many people, a voice that they'd never had before, uh, particularly in, in places that were news deserts or, 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 or there's a real power disparity, um, like the Texas border and other places, um, sort of harking back to what, you know, the, the origins of Sullivan, when you had the disparity between segregationist whites and, and the civil rights movement. Um, so Sullivan has been uh, really, really important for safeguarding the free speech of just ordinary citizens to speak truth to power. And Floyd, what does it look like inside newsrooms, the impact? Well, it makes a, uh, it, it doesn't have um, a major effect. And I, I think there are people on the Supreme Court that literally don't know this. It doesn't have very much of an effect within the newsroom on a day-to-day -day basis because newspapers try to get things right. Even without Sullivan, they would try to do that. It has an effect on the newsroom in a, a different way. One is, uh, as all three of us have pointed out, that it protects against what? Enormous uh, libel judgments when journalists are doing something which is writing something unpopular. Uh, we, we don't have to beat up on the South, the old South about this, but, but it, it's not just, uh, on, on the racial side in lots and lots of situations where journalists have written about people in power, uh, and have wound up sued. Uh, a, a related point, I just want to say on the, on the 50th anniversary of New York Times against Sullivan, the Atlantic Monthly published a, uh, uh, an article signed on by, you know, tons of teams of journalists. And what they were saying, New York Times versus Sullivan, had given them most is protection if they make a mistake. Journalists make mistakes sometimes. And if it's an honest mistake, what New York Times versus Sullivan does in cases involving writing about public people is to afford protection uh, in the case of an honest error uh, by a journalist. And, and that, too, was one of the major results and perhaps uh, intentions. But intentions aside, it really has given a good deal of, pro of protection within the newsroom. But it hasn't changed at least what our great newspapers try to do well, just to get the story right. Well, I want to I want to move to the controversy now, right? Because uh, the three of you are, it sounds like, pretty big supporters of the ruling in Sullivan. You think the court got it right, but that's not a unanimous opinion, particularly right now. Uh, although the, the decision <laughs> in 1964 was unanimous, you have sitting Supreme Court justices uh, who kind of reject some of the arguments and premises. Uh, that were laid out in that decision, uh, namely Justice Clarence Thomas and Neil Gorsuch. They argue, for example, that the actual malice standard that was established in Sullivan should be revisited. Thomas argues that this standard allows news media to get away with life-altering falsehoods. Uh, and to your point, Floyd, Gorsuch argues that the standard 
laid out in Sullivan made a lot more sense in 1964 when there were fewer and more reliable sources of news and less clickbait journalism, right? You talk about how you, you, you call them our great newspapers. You know, they have fact-checking departments. They try and get things right. Um, you know, news has, news reporting has kind of been democratized in the era of Substack and, and social media. A lot of times we get our news from Twitter, for example. And so what Gorsuch says in a dissent from uh, the court's decision not to take up a certain libel case. He said, what started in 1964 with the decision to tolerate the occasional falsehood to ensure robust reporting by a comparative handful of print and broadcast outlets has evolved into an ironclad subsidy for the publication of falsehoods by means and on a scale previously unimaginable. So how do we think about Sullivan in the era of democratized reporting on Twitter and Substack and all these other blogs that you see proliferating. Places where you ha can have someone out there on a internet chat forum uh, say that a pizza parlor here down the road in DC uh, is home to uh, a satanic pedophile ring, for example. And I'll let any of you who want to jump in take that one. So I actually, it's funny. Um, the, the, the case you reference is Brescia versus Lawson, um, and it was a, a, a case uh, that I had the uh, privilege of representing our in-house um, uh, subsidy or subsidiary, excuse me, um, uh, Simon and Schuster. In it was a dip, deeply researched book, uh, and Gorsuch's opinion in the context of a deeply researched book about a matter of clear public concern. This was like something about Albania? Yeah, so the, 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 the plaintiff in the case um, was the son of the former Albanian prime minister. Uh, there was an allegation in the book uh, about the plaintiff's involvement in alleged criminality. Uh, it had been covered in, in, in news outlets prior to the publication of the book. And again, it was a deeply researched book. So I just, find, I wanna, I want, just wanna say that off the top because I find um, Gorsuch's opinion in the context of the case, and it was just a dissent from denial of certiari, which is just a, um, you know, a, a an, an opinion that justices can write when the court denies to hear a case, right? So it had the opinion itself has no precedential value, and our, I think our listeners should know that um, it is essentially a judicial op-ed. And Justice Gorsuch, in that context, he's talking about, you know, the complete lack of uh, fact checking nowadays and, you know, the sky is falling and yada, yada, yada. It just seems so disconnected from the actual malice rule. Um, if anything, when you when you look at his opinion, when you look at the things that he is um, criticizing, it seems more that he's criticizing Section 230, which protects uh, various internet uh, uh, computer services from, from liability for speech provided by third parties. And the court just yesterday began hearing a Section 230 case, and it seems unwilling to you know, do anything in the Section 230 context if we take any pointers from the yeah, This argument. is the Gonzalez v. Google case. There's another case... Uh... Yeah, exactly. Being heard today. And so it's it's kind of strange to me. I, I mean, I take his concern about our overall information climate, but it's not at all clear that the state of our information economy is because of Sullivan. So I just, I, I you know, accept his criticisms, but I'm just not sure he's, his target is correct. And then, you know, I'll posit a question um, for all of you as well. I, I do wonder if the issue, if Sullivan has just, it's clearly been politicized at this point, and I think it'll continue to get more and more politicized. And we can obviously talk about, um, you know, what that looks like in the coming years. But there was a companion case, as, as the folks on this call know, to New York Times versus Sullivan, which was Abernathy versus Sullivan, which was um, for ministers whose name had been put on the advertisement. And I wonder if Justice Brennan made a mistake when he really decided to focus more so, I think, on New York Times and less so on the four individuals. To go back to JT's point, the actual malice rule is not a, a subsidy for the news media. The actual malice rule 
is a protection that everyone shares. And I don't think I'm surprising anyone by saying that the media is not horribly popular, has not been horribly popular for a long time. And I wonder if Sullivan's connection to the media and the politicization of the media is ultimately going to be the undoing of Sullivan. Yeah, I mean, I don't have the data in front of me, but the data is clear that respect and appreciation for the news media has been declining over the years. And I think much in the way that folks see Section 230 as protecting internet companies um, from any sort of liability related to the spread of myths or disinformation, whatever the uh, boogeyman is today, uh, they see this, the same sort of protections that Sullivan provides to the news media as giving them cover to, uh, in, in some cases, produce what people argue to be biased journalism or falsehoods. I, I mean, I want to, you know, I know the case that was up before the court that Gorsuch issued his dissent from taking up on, um, you know, might not be the best context in which to discuss the criticisms of Sullivan. So I want to move to, you know, another example, which is uh, Nicholas Sandman and the Lincoln Memorial kind of debacle of 2019. I don't know if you guys recall this, but on January 18th, 2019, a number of news outlets reported on a confrontation that happened in front of the Lincoln Memorial involving a high school student and a Native American man named Nathan Phillips. And initial reports based on sort of kind of limited video that was circulating on Twitter and elsewhere described one student, Nicholas Sandman, as kind of harassing and mocking this Native American man while he's wearing a red MAGA hat, uh, which then led to death threats against Nicholas, doxing, and um, later a statement from his school, Covington High School, condemning him uh, for allegedly mocking. Uh, but later, once um, I believe Robbie Suave did the initial for, over at Reason did a lot of the initial reporting that uncovered this, there, there were longer videos that came out, and it turns out uh, that the Native American man was not being mocked by the student. The Native American was trying to a man was trying to defuse the situation because the students were actually being uh, bullied, called um, homophobic slurs by a group of Black Hebrew Israelites. So the situation was just much more complicated, but it more or less. Um, you know, resulted in serious threats on Nicholas's life. And, and uh, you know, he later filed lawsuits against a number of news organizations. Um, he settled with CNN, The Washington Post, and NBC Universal later, but he lost his suits against, for example, The New York Times, CBS, ABC, Rolling Stone, um, and some Gannett publications. So, you know, in this case, and this is probably an opportunity to maybe pivot a little bit to discuss how Sullivan has been expanded from public officials to public figures. Um, you know, how should we think about that case and the real world harm that can come from false, particularly early reporting when the situations are unclear uh, about, in this case, uh, a minor student who was thrust into the public spotlight through no choice of his own? Well, I, I just weigh in and say that was a very hard case. Characterizing him <clears throat> as the press argued, as a a public figure, limited purpose, no less, public figure because he was speaking out on a matter of public interest it is the sort of uh, farthest extension of, of Sullivan and one of the more controversial extensions or expansions. I mean, Sullivan... I mean, it wasn't an easy case at all, but the current uh, interpretation of uh, Sullivan uh, is, I think, harder to justify than the initial one. Um, and I think that the Sandman case is a good uh, illustration uh, of, of that, uh, just as Brennan certainly was talking most in Sullivan about criticism of government. Uh, and, you know, then we moved on from there to, in effect, powerful people, people who, by the, the nature of their fame, have impact uh, on the world. Uh, Kelly Clarkson is a public figure. Uh, Derek Jeter is a public figure. And false criticism of them uh, is protected under New York Times against Sullivan uh, as interpreted. Uh, 
uh, uh, so, so long as there was uh, uh, actual malice proved. Uh, I mean, the, 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 those seem to me, again, harder cases. Uh, the Sandman case, one of the hardest yet. And I think the answer to it may be that, quite contrary to the current mood, at least of some members of the Supreme Court, the, the sense of the ultimate uh, juridical deciders of it was everything occurred here in public. It was about a matter of genuine public interest. And the criticism of him was false, but innocently so, uh, in the sense that they weren't trying to destroy someone that they knew hadn't expressed views that, uh, of, of which they disapproved. But the farther we move from Sullivan, the farther we move from uh, publications uh, to individuals, and then beyond that, uh, it seems to me, you know, the more, the closer the case comes. Uh, now, it seems to me the members of the Supreme Court who are dissenting from continuing Sullivan, who'd like to overrule Sullivan, view it precisely the opposite. What, what, what they are offended by is the press. Reportage about public, really public matters which uh, I think uh, Sullivan was absolutely right about and has served the public well. Well, you have a professor at the University of Tennessee, a law professor, Glenn Reynolds, some of, uh, who you might be familiar with, who wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, I believe in 2021, who, you know, he's a conservative, uh, argued that Sullivan really isn't the culprit. It was the subsequent cases uh, that came in 1967, such as Time v. Hill and Curtis Publishing v. Butts, which expanded, of course, the ruling in Sullivan regarding public officials to public figures. And then in the 1970s, you had two other cases that expanded public figures to include ordinary citizens who thrust themselves into public, uh, public debates, which according to Glenn Reynolds meant, quote, anyone, however obscure, who spoke out would lose traditional protection against libel and slander. And he uses as an example in his op-ed, um, and 2014, the New York Daily News reported on uh, a woman's allegation that Bill Cosby had raped her four decades earlier. And uh, Mr. Cosby's lawyer, in this case, Marty Singer, wrote a letter to the paper threatening legal action. And Mrs. McKee, who was the accuser in this, um, sued Mr. Cosby, alleging that Cosby's lawyer had defamed her on the comedian's behalf. And according to the courts, uh, the fact that having accused a famous person, in this case, Bill Cosby, of rape was enough to make her, uh, Catherine McKee, a limited purpose public figure, uh, which, according to Glenn Reynolds, and I don't know the specific of it, doomed her lawsuit. Uh, and so when the Supreme Court declined to hear her appeal in 2019, Justice Thomas filed a lone dissent calling for Sullivan to be overturned, as he as he's done, I think, on at least two occasions. Um and you even had law professor Cass Sunstein, who's I think the most pr prolific legal scholar of our day and age, said that it's hardly obvious that the First Amendment forbids rape victims such as Catherine McKee from seeking some kind of redress from people who defame them. So, I mean, does does anyone in the group think that there are some problems in the way that Sullivan I and mean, Floyd? It sounds like you are, get a little bit more skeptical the further you way to get get away from Sullivan, but. Could it be that the way Sullivan has advanced over the years has kind of opened it up to criticism, so to speak? Yes, I think so. Uh, you know, as to whether those cases are wrong, uh, maybe I'm copping out, but <laughs> I really haven't uh, decided for myself. Uh, the Cosby case is a, is a very, very good one uh, to, to use in talking about just how far the, the theories, the, in my view, the quite correct theories of Sullivan uh, uh, should be carried uh, forward. Uh, I mean, I think it's one thing to say that with respect to a public figure like Cosby, he certainly is uh, uh, in every way a public figure and things people say about him uh, ought to be, 
presumptively protected unless they were knowingly false. But when you move away from that and, and you move into the woman who said something and about Cosby, uh, I'm not sure how to finish my sentence. Uh, I wouldn't it's weep. It's more difficult. I wouldn't weep if the, <laughs> if the court said, well, you know, not, not that far. Uh, from the from the core of Sullivan about being able to to, to falsely criticize the government. JT, what are, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I, I share Floyd's uh, stance. It's hard to kind of say whether you know the, the extended cases, the Gertz v. Welch, uh, those kinds of cases were right or not. Uh, I will say I. You know, Do we know if those cases were uh, were unanimous in the same way Sullivan was, or were those divided courts? Gertz was divided. If I'm, I might be mistaken, but yeah. yes, 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 that they were divided. Yeah, um, but you know, the, the the main thrust of of you know my response to somebody like Ren Reynolds is, yeah, you know, I think Gertz, the limited purpose public figure doctrine, those leave room for discussion. But what's going on today is, you know, politicians, commentators are turning around and making Sullivan the boogeyman. Sullivan's not the problem, right? Sullivan was right. Sullivan drilled down the central concept of the First Amendment, right? That Republican form of government demands that we fiercely guard uh, our national debate. So I think as, as Floyd pointed out, when you have a situation like Nicholas Salmon, something that takes place on the National Mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial, it's heated. That's in the public eye. And yeah, it, it's unfortunate, but that's the breathing space the First Amendment demands. That's what makes us uniquely, our, our free speech culture and our First Amendment so uniquely American, uh, is that we tolerate, right, a little bit of error. We tolerate a little bit of, of caustic reporting and criticism for those things that happen in public because we understand it's important to our ability to govern ourselves. Um, you know, there, there was a case that the Supreme Court uh, released shortly after Sullivan called Rosenblum, and, and they actually adopted uh, a public matter of public concern standard instead of a public figure standard. And for whatever reason, the Supreme Court said, <laughs> like about a year or two later, Matt can probably correct me on this, but we're not going to do that. We're going to go with the public figure uh, doctrine instead. That's always struck me as curious. If, if the thrust of Sullivan is about protecting and upholding that national debate, why wouldn't you tie the actual malice rule to whether or something was a genuine matter of public concern? That seems more uh, faithful to the Sullivan, uh, and maybe maybe not would eliminate some of the problems we have with the limited purpose public figure doctrine. But I, I would love to hear what, what Matt and Floyd have to say about that, if, if anything. I think that's I think that's right. Um, you know, we w let me assure you. So New Jersey and New York now both have essentially that adopted that doctrine at, uh, at a state level. Um, if it's not in, in New York, for example, if it's not a matter of purely private concern, the plaintiff is going to have to plead and ultimately prove actual malice. People still have reputations in New York. <laughs> you know, where it's okay. Um, I think it's looked at as kind of a, a, a boogeyman if you extend it too far. But I, you know, I think that the, the plurality in Rosenblum was exactly right. Um, and I think that is the basis on which uh, Chief Justice Warren in uh, Curtis Publishing versus Butts extended Sullivan in the first place to public figures. It's this idea um, that there are certain issues of public concern that people in a republic have, you know, the right to talk about without fear of losing their 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 houses. And, you know, phrased that way, I find the, the approach of states like New Jersey and New York rather convincing. We're simply going to put outside of the realm of judicial intervention, by and large, um, debates about matters of public policy. We're not going to have judges decide if this particular global warming scientist is um, you know truthful with his data, untruthful with his data, fudged his data, whatever it might be. Um, we're not going to have judges uh, engage in scopes trial after scopes trial, resolving key issues uh, of public debate that that 
are currently raging. Well, well Matthew, let me let me ask you something because another one of Glenn Reynolds' criticisms is uh, regarding w- what happened in the two thousands in some procedural decisions. Uh, Bell Atlantic Corp v. Twombly and Ashcroft v. Iqbal. He says these precedents allow a case to be dismissed before the plaintiff can engage in discovery unless the plaintiff can demonstrate, not merely allege, actual malice. So you can't actually figure out whether actual malice occurred because you cannot get to the discovery stage in these cases. So you talk about the the scientist, right? The climate scientist. Like you never get an opportunity to actually look at his notes or his data that might prove actual malice. You act, you, you kind of have to have a knowledge of it. Um and demonstrate it before the discovery phase. Do you guys see that as, you know, something that's opened up to cr- criticism as well? Let me see. I, I think those cases, uh, which sweep, of course, well beyond libel uh, or the like, which are general cases to assure that that our courts are not overflowing with, with frivolous cases and that people who are sued on no basis at all have a way to get out of these cases early rather than late. The, the danger of those cases is always that there is something that you don't know yet when you sue, and if the courts would allow you to go on and on and on, you might find it. Uh, but the cost-benefit analysis with respect, and I'm talking now about the legal system as a whole, is that you want to bring a case uh, in federal court, which is where these these uh, rulings apply, uh, you have to have a good faith basis for it. That, you know, you can't just say something. And and that's the rise of the anti-slap statutes, right? Strategic yeah, lawsuits yeah. against public participation, which sort of punish these sort of frivolous lawsuits that show right. speech. And, and I, I just think we just have to acknowledge and live with the proposition that, you know, some suits that might have been valid at the end of the day, if only the plaintiff had had discovery, uh, will fail. Uh, uh, And in my view and the view of the courts so far with respect to these cases, including but not limited to libel cases, is that in the service of uh, of assuring that innocent defendants are not too easily hauled into court on the basis of nothing much, that will require a plaintiff to show some sort of serious basis for commencing the case. And it goes back to, to, to keep drawing analogies, piggybacking on Floyd here to the criminal context. Um, you know, in, a, in an interview um, in the 50s, Edward Bennett Williams, a, a, a famed trial lawyer, um, was asked essentially, you know, how can you defend all of these um, all of these criminals, all of these, uh, you know, all of these racketeering folks and whatnot. And he gave precisely the same answer. It is better to let one guilty man go free than put 10 uh, innocent men in jail. And I think we can draw that analogy again back to the speech context, as Floyd was just saying. And indeed, the court has recognized uh, Justice O'Connor in Philadelphia Newspapers versus Hepps, a case um, about the plaintiff having to prove falsity. Uh, she recognized and writing for the court recognized that this might mean that some valid claims aren't successful, but there, that, that is essentially what the first amendment requires of us. <laughs> you have some civil libertarians like the late Nat Hentoff, for example, who argued that defamation <laughs> claims should be eliminated altogether because of the chilling effect that they have on speech. I think when you're a free speech advocate, you, you try and push the boundaries of what's protected. You don't want to be, you don't want anybody else to be more Catholic than the Pope, so to speak. Um, because there are real risks, uh, and, and ju- to- justice black and, and, and Douglas, I think, and Sullivan and Goldberg as well, even said the actual malice rule went too far. Uh, they would have said there's an absolute privilege. And of course, justice black's view was when the first amendment says Congress shall make no law, they meant no law, including libel law. Unless you were talking about uh, students in the high school context, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Teachers with no liar. Yeah. So um, I know I said I'd keep you for only an hour. We've got a, five minutes left if I can, if I can uh, take that time. I want to ask about a new law 
that was, or a new bill, I should say, that was introduced in Florida this week. So earlier this week on February 20th, the Florida legislator introduced a bill that seeks to roll back some of Sullivan's protections. Um, the bill came shortly after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis attacked Sullivan and signaled that a new bill would be, soon be introduced uh, to limit what he sees as the news media's deleterious effects on society. So the original iteration of the bill, there's been a second, the original iteration has been redrawn, there's been a second that's passed, it's more expanded, but the original iteration would have narrowed the list of people who may be deemed public figures, uh, declare that speech from anonymous sources would be presumed false. Um, so I guess like Thomas Paine's common sense, Federalist, Anti-Federalist papers, America has this long tradition of anonymous speech. So it just seems sort of ahistorical that the First Amendment wouldn't protect that sort of speech that formed America. But Justice Thomas would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the bill would also mandate that failure to, quote, verify or corroborate an alleged defamatory statement would, uh, would constitute actual malice. And what's more, the bill proposes awarding costs and attorney's fees to any plaintiff who wins a defamation suit. Now, I said that bill had been withdrawn, and then the next day, a new bill had introduced been introduced with all those same um, changes, but it would also, the new version, eliminate the qualified journalist privilege for professional journalists and defamation claims, meaning professional journalists can be compelled to identify anonymous sources or materials um, in a defamation case without the plaintiff having to show some sort of need for that. Matt, Matthew, you've kind of had a big Twitter thread uh, going about the bill and some of the stuff that's happened in Florida. So I, I'd love for you to take a moment to kind of dissect this and what you think might be right about it, or it seems like you think there's a lot wrong with it. So I think rather than get down into the weeds on this particular provisions, many of which in any event are unconstitutional, uh, at least. Yeah, and we only have a few. Yeah, minutes, at least so. as the law is currently. Um, I would say this. My concern right now is that we'll, we will see essentially a Dobbs effect in the law of libel, where states will start uh, introducing and passing this kind of legislation that either attempts to limit uh, First Amendment protections for freedom of speech and freedom of the press, or attempts to set up a conflict that will put the issue before the Supreme Court, much like we saw with Roe. I think this is really nefarious. Um, to So to just to briefly go back, and that's a risky thing to say when I'm about to say to the 18th century, but to briefly go back <laughs> to the 18th century, um, Thomas Cooper who uh, Thomas Jefferson once called the greatest man in America. He, he said that the doctrine of libel is in all countries a doctrine of power. And really what I think these laws are attempting to do and the push against, the Sullivan, against Sullivan is attempting is to limit speech and bring public debate and uh, public critics to heal uh, to allow... Um, you know, certain political factions to get what they want. I don't want to make it sound political. I think it is po political, but I think it's real. Uh, it strikes really at the roots of democracy. This idea, again, going back to exactly what Floyd mentioned at the beginning with Sullivan, where you have Alabama officials getting together and deciding, hey, we can use this doctrine of libel to keep life like it is right now. And I'm afraid that that's what we're going to see going forward we can use these attacks on Sullivan and we can use the doctrine of libel in order to kind of um, bend that what is supposed to be robust on inhibited and wide open public debate to our desires and demands. So that's why I think um, laws like this are, or bills like this are especially pernicious. Do you guys think we have five votes on the Supreme Court to overturn portions of Sullivan, Floyd? Oh, when you add the word portions of, it makes it harder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I just have a hard time imagining them over, you know, overturning the precedent completely. But, you know, what do I know? I mean, there are a, a few votes. I mean, we know there are, I think we know there are at least two. Horses and, and I, Thomas. I think, I think there are more. No, I don't think there are five. Uh, but no, look, Justice Kagan, when she was a scholar, wrote a, a, a law review article arguing that, that uh, the interpretation of Sullivan, which she approved of Sullivan, had gone too far with respect to, uh, and I'm not doing her justice, but movie stars, you know, or not government officials. Um, and so, yeah, it's conceivable that they might 
narrow it some. What concerns me most is that it is conceivable, although unlikely in my view, that they could do a, a, a Dobbs uh, result, that, that they could have five. Uh, I don't think they do. And one of the reasons to, to just use a name is that uh, Justice Kavanaugh, as a court of appeals judge, wrote a number of libel opinions, which I thought were sort of healthy applications of New York Times versus Sullivan, sort of un, untrammeled by, uh, I'm sorry, I have to do this uh, sort of language. Uh, so I, I don't think the votes are there now. But uh, what, if uh, former President Trump were reelected and he got a chance and not just he, but he got a chance to appoint some more justices. Sure, it would be at risk. Yeah, he called it for opening up the libel laws. I also do. I don't think you'd get Roberts's vote here just because he's he's very skeptical oh, of anything that's that's going to clog up the courts. And if you get rid of Sullivan, you're going to just clog up the courts, right? I, I think I think the Chief Justice not only views himself but correctly views himself as a defender of the First Amendment. JT, any final thoughts here before we close up? Yeah, I mean, I, I share Matt and, and Floyd's, you know, concerns. I mean, if before last summer, if you had asked me if, if there's a, a chance in heck that Sullivan would have been overturned, I would have said no. But with Dobbs and Bruin coming along, it, it gives me a little bit of pause. Uh, I, I will give sort of one ray of hope. And I, there was there was a petition before the court last year, uh, Coral Ridge v. Uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, which factually sort of set up what I was concerned about was sort of a, a case right for them to take. You had a, a Christian group who was a plaintiff suing the Southern Poverty Law Center because they designated them as a hate group. Um, both the district court and the 11th Circuit dismissed the case exclusively on actual malice. So you had a Christian group uh, who was declared a limited purpose public figure uh, getting their defamation case tossed on actual malice. Um, and after, I don't know, 10 or 11 delays from the Supreme Court about whether they were going to decide it, they finally said, with a lone dissent from Justice Thomas, no, we're not going to hear this case. So that gives me a little bit of hope that maybe they're going to keep Sullivan in place. Um, but, you know, and also Sullivan was unanimous. And, and, and as we discussed earlier, it, it, it's got its, it, it's underpinned so much more of the court's First Amendment doctrine that hopefully... Um, they leave it in place and let it do the good work it's done for 60 years. Well, JT, I think we're going to leave it there with that ray of hope. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate you coming on the show and I hope to do it again soon. That was Floyd Abrams, JT Morris, and Matthew Schaefer. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to So To Speak wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a future episode. This episode was hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleagues, Ella Ross and Aaron Reese. You can learn more about So To Speak by subscribing to us on our YouTube channel, which is linked in the show notes and features video of this conversation. You can also follow us on Twitter or Instagram by searching for the handle Free Speech Talk. And we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. We take email feedback at so to speak at the fire.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever else you get your podcasts. They do help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, I thank you all for listening.